So I hope everybody is having a fabulous week. And if not, don't worry. We will change that today because we have incredible <laughs> people here with us that can inspire us all for a good weekend ahead. People that have inspired me big time throughout my career and either through our friendship or our work together. My name is Felipe Villela, the founder of Renature, a Dutch organization working on making regenerative agriculture mainstream. I'm also a TEDx speaker and a Forbes under 30. When I was a child, my mom told me that if we take something out of nature, we need to give it back because nature has its own balance. Since then, I have always searched for balance in nature. My mom always taught me. I come from a citrus farming family business in the countryside of Sao Paulo, Limeira in Brazil. Growing up in nature, I have always been passionate about agricultural systems that dialogues with nature. And there's no better system to achieve that balance than regenerative agriculture. Regenerative farming describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. Renature truly believes that nature and agriculture can cooperate instead of compete. We also believe that farmers and local communities across the globe deserve a long-term profitable future. As part of the leadership team on UN Food System Summit Action Track 3, Boost Nature Positive Production, I would like to challenge the discussion we have today around regenerative agriculture for a nature positive production system following the theme of this year's Earth Day, Restore Our Earth. This dialogue will be focused on restoration through systems change. I will be moderating together with this incredible panel with, you know, with all these people that comes from, there are leaders in the industry to discuss the potential for a profitable transition to regenerative agriculture. So first, we will go through a short introduction of the panelists describing their work, their initiatives, and and also would like to challenge them to answer the question, why regenerative agriculture for a nature positive production system for our food systems in the next decade? Secondly, we will open for 30 minutes discussion around the topics of transition finance and policymakers engagement. Following the title, the role of corporates and investors in financing the transition towards regenerative practices as well as the role of the UN Food Systems Summit in engaging policymakers to adopt regenerative agriculture in our food systems. Lastly, we will have a Q&A session with you from the audience to try to answer some of these questions that has been raised and rank them in the top as the most interesting ones. If you like somebody's questions, you can upvote these questions so that we can see it in the end, which ones are in the top. So if you have got any questions during the discussions, please add them below on the Q&A option and the name of the person you are directing this question. Samantha, our head of communications, will thankfully have, or, uh, have organized this great dialogue today. We'll try to reply to some questions during the session. So now I would like to invite all our thought leaders. Uh, Christine Gold, CEO of Thought for Food, the most energetic and happy woman besides my mom I have ever met. Uh, she's, 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 the star, she's the star of engaging young entrepreneurs in changing the game in the food industry. Marain Dos, Global Director of Open Innovation and Circular Economy for Food at The Known. I have met Marain recently on our collaboration between Renation and The Known, and I must admit, I'm extremely impressed by his passion, enthusiasm, and wisdom about nature and circular economy. Glad to know him well now, so I can always invite him for inspiration. And Emma Chow, lead of food and food initiative for the Ella McCartan Foundation, a courageous woman leading the food initiatives within MNF. Not an easy task as it has so many stakeholders involved in this process and she does it perfectly well. And lucky her to have Mike in Brazil to handle Latin projects because he's doing an excellent job as well. Guilherme Amado, leader in sustainability quality for Nespresso. Our physical meetings always has coffee and nature. Uh, Guy is, a fa is fantastically managing the portfolio of regenerative agriculture projects in Brazil, working directly with its suppliers and a big believer of agroecology. So not only Brazil, but also Hawaii. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> uh, Jose Pugas, partner and head of ESG and agribusiness for JGP Asset Management. What can I say about Pugas? We have met a few months ago, and now we are setting up funds to regenerative agriculture 
playing beach tennis in Rio. And soon as he invites me, of course, we will play golf as well. Uh, so working for one of the largest asset management organizations in Brazil, Pugas is a genius in agribusiness and ESG industry in the country. You have got any questions about green investments in agribusiness? Ask Pugas. Federico Bellone, uh, lead regenerative food systems and nature-based solutions at UNFCC Race to Zero. I met Federico at a fabulous regeneration gathering at Sinaldo Valley in Rio with many other inspiring people from Sistema B, Guayaquil, and so on. Federico is doing an incredible job at putting regenerative agriculture as a key topic for the COP26 this year. Thais Fontes, a Senior Relationship Manager, uh, Food and Agriculture Networks at Rabobank. Changing her career from Brazil to the Netherlands as she will be closer to the green agenda of Rabobank now. Thais have done impressive work in Rabo Customer Relationship Manager and now with strategic relations developing high level initiatives in the sustainable agriculture space. Now, let's give the floor to the woman first, of course. So please, Christine, introduce yourself, the incredible work of TFF across the globe and the, an answer to the question, why Regen Ag for a nature policy production system for our food systems. Thank you so much and hello everyone. Greetings from Switzerland. As Felipe mentioned, my name is Christine Gold and I have the pleasure and honor of uh, serving a global community of next generation innovators and entrepreneurs to build uh, sustainable, inclusive and regenerative solutions to food and agriculture's prevailing challenges. Um, my organization has been around for um, about a decade now, actually. And in that time, we've worked with 60,000 young people in 175 countries, and we've helped to um, catalyze the creation of and launch startups across the entire spectrum of uh, food and agriculture and in every region of the world. And in fact, uh, Felipe took part in our programs and met his co-founder for Renature at one of our global events. So the connection is strong. Um, what we are trying to do is, you know, bring not only new startups to the space, but really new minds and new methods that are focused on more creativity and collaboration and impact and bringing together all kinds of new ideas and approaches that haven't been brought together before. And that is kind of my answer to your question. Why regenerative agriculture um, for nature positive production? Well, one, we don't have time to waste. And two, we have an incredible opportunity ahead. Regenerative agriculture represents the chance to bring together knowledge, technology, and scale in a way that hasn't happened before. And that's why I really am impressed and inspired by what you're doing with Renature, which is like mainstreaming this concept. And not just for agriculture, but for how we think about every challenge facing the world and how we do business itself. So really thrilled to be here and um, hopefully represent the viewpoints of the next generations around the world who are passion-driven, purpose-minded, and you know, building the solutions that our future requires. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Like it's, it's always a huge pleasure to be together having these discussions. And, and yes, like me, Marco and I, we have met at the Thought for Food uh, which is, is, if you guys don't know what food yet, uh, you guys are you're losing time, you know, in life because it's really the most fantastic uh, events uh, that we have in the year. So I, I, ho I hope you guys can join the next ones. So I will give the floor to Emma uh, to introduce herself and uh, so that we can continue. Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Chow and I'm joining you today from the Isle of Wight in England and you may have never heard of this place. I hadn't either until I moved here a few years ago to join the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but we happen to be based out of here and it is a cool spot. Um, and so great to be here with fellow panelists, some of whom I know quite well as well. So it's, it's quite fun to be in this global community today. I lead the food initiative, which Felipe was mentioning up top, and that is one of our global programs at the foundation that's dedicated to really redesigning entire segments of the economy. Um, you may have heard of our work on plastics and fashion, and we've got one on food. And the circular economy, if you're unfamiliar to that, it really is about shifting out of our current highly linear, degrading, polluting, 
system to one that is restorative and regenerative by design. And that shift does take a fundamental redesign and to Christine's point, like thinking differently, doing things differently. Um, and that's where we come back to regenerative agriculture. And this isn't necessarily something new, right? What is new is actually bringing forward principles of, of our ancestors and, and times before us in new ways and leveraging technologies and innovations to make it mainstream. And what's my focus, so I'm gonna be speaking about agriculture primarily from a food perspective today, but what I think is so special is, is food unlike anything else it is part of nature, right? We're, we're consuming it. You know, it's not just like our clothes that we can keep forever. We actually need to grow more and more of it to feed ourselves. And it has a fundamental purpose of, of not just fueling our bodies with nutrition and underpilling, underpinning our cultures and our identity and our social interactions, but also has the power to help tackle some of the biggest challenges of our time that we're facing and with, with climate change and biodiversity, especially this year with the COP events, this is the decade. And so food and agriculture has to be cemented right in the core of the solutions. And it does have the power if we do it right and we work with nature rather than against it, which we've been doing in recent decades. But it's just rewiring our relationship and working with it. Philippe, you're using the word balance at the beginning, I think for me, that's that's the word too. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emma. That's absolutely true. Like, food has a, like a huge role for us to transform, you know, our industry and 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 also how we we behave as humans in this in the environment where we are. Uh, so it's, it's something that we need to have three days uh, on a daily basis. So so it's it's you know like it's the essence of everything. Uh, so thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and now I'll move to, uh, uh, to Thais. So Thais, uh, feel free to, to introduce yourself. Hi, thank you all for joining today. Thanks, Felipe, for inviting me for this event. I'm speaking from Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, yet. Yeah, I'm moving to the Netherlands, waiting for the consulate to reopen and all this stuff here due to COVID, some problems, we've been facing some problems. Um, yeah, I work for Habo for nine years now, always in sustainability team, now joining the Food and Agri Networks team. Um, here in Brazil, focus on the farmers and the corporate clients and how we can create a better agribusiness in, in the sector. So when we talk about a bank working in, in, in agro, so Habo Bank is the biggest uh, bank in the world that works, it's, it's focused on, on agribusiness. So our um, main activities, it's all driven to, to increase this market. And when we talk about regenerative agriculture and bank, I'm not talking about only financing this sector, but as I'm a bank that is focused on agribusiness, I need this market, I need these farmers and the, the, the whole chain to, uh, uh, to be active for a long term. If they are not thinking on environment, if they are not thinking on productivity, if they are not thinking on how they are dealing with the, the land and their the work, they will not be pro profitable for so long and they will not be my clients anymore. So it's a bank thinking in business, but also thinking in how to grow this better world together. Uh, this is the main driven uh, or the main vision of Habo Bank these days is how to develop and how to help our clients on achieving all these goals that is a common goal with all of these colleagues here as a panelist and all the, the people that have joined. So how we can do this together. Uh, regenerative agri is something that it's the solution. Uh, we have seen this in Brazil with uh, integration livestock crop forest system, for instance. So you take a, a, a really degraded area and you can transform this in a super farm. And I'm not talking about only small farmers, but big, uh, big farmers as well. It's not something just driven for small ones. Um, yeah. Uh, I will stop now to give floor for the others and then we can continue the conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Thais. That's, yeah, that's absolutely important uh, to look at how, uh, you know, how uh, a bank can play a role uh, in fostering uh, more initiatives uh, into the regenerative agriculture space. 
And it's incredible to see that the vision of Rabobank now is really looking at, you know, look, including sustainable agriculture, regenerative practices in their portfolio. Like recently I got, you know, the news that Rabobank is, is being part of a 160 million fund uh, in Brazil about regenerative agriculture. So it's, it's really amazing yeah. to see this kind of news. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. And then now I'll jump uh, to Pugas uh, so that he can introduce himself. I'm already saying his last name because we're already too in uh, really intimate. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I'll leave him to introduce himself and uh, I'm happy to have you here, Pugas. Thank you, Felipe. Don't worry, nobody calls me Jose anymore, not even my mother. So please feel free to call me Pugas anytime you want. Uh, I'm, the, I'm partner and head at JGP. JGP is one of the largest asset managers in Brazil. We existed for the last two decades. So we've seen a lot happen in Brazil and across the world. But uh, on the last two years, we had uh, an epiphany, as I may say, uh, with the disasters at Fali, uh, the temperatures that caused all the nature disasters in Brazil. We start to face uh, through a reality, a hard reality. Uh, we, have, we are responsible for the consequences of our investments. Uh, financial sector is a data-based, uh, uh, it's information-based sector. We, uh, so if you are an information-based industry, you can't ignore the data related to our responsibility over our investments. So here at JGP, when it has this epiphany, uh, we are people, we're not just a company, but we are formed by people, by human beings that have empathy with other human beings, uh, we decided that we had to change after two decades of existence, that we have to have a more uh, responsible approach to investment. And uh, nowadays, uh, for a quick, uh, regenerative agriculture, we accept the challenge to develop new innovative financial mechanisms to promote easier access uh, for regenerative agriculture here in Brazil. Uh, we know that we have a lot of uh, uh, peculiarities in Brazil uh, in the credit scenario that we can talk a little more later. Um, I is this here to help me a lot to discuss about that. Um, but uh, I think that to answer your question about why regenerative agriculture, uh, mostly because we believe that uh, to feed can't be uh, can't mean to harm. Uh, to feed is a, to nurture. To feed is a, such a, a wonderful act. So we can't mean to harm uh, to harm the planet, the mankind, the, and the next generations. And uh, regenerative culture, from in, among all the responses that we studied, is by, by far the best way to approach the future of farm, the fu future of food production, um, mostly because it's profitable. Um, it's important for financial sector to be profitable. Uh, it's not a utopia. It's a real solution that can uh, provide profits. Um, it's nature positive, as you may quite well um, has told, and uh, it's farmer centric. And that's something that we have to foster more and more to improve the regenerative agriculture, to be farmer centric. And regenerative agriculture has this power to talk with the farmer, to prove to the farmer that is possible, to engage the farmer and make it happen. That, so that's why we believe that regenerative agriculture is the way uh, to the future of food production, not only in Brazil, but worldwide. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pugas. This is, is a really like a strong uh, and inspiring like saying, you know, like becoming from an asset management that you guys, you know, manage so many funds going to uh, different directions and industries. Uh, and you are taking this lead in the agribusiness within this fund uh, that it's carrying out the regenerative agriculture, uh, you know, principles. Uh, so it, it has like really like really uh, powerful impact over the long term uh, to, to have you on, on that seat. So thank you so much. Uh, Federico, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Felipe. Um, I think you, you take the prize for the most flattering and warm introductions. Uh, deeply honored, not just myself, but also to be sharing uh, this space uh, with these speakers, some of them I, I did not know, so I'm already making uh, new friends, really. Um, you've introduced us as thought leaders. Uh, I'd like to think of myself in my capacity right now, more of an action leader. Uh, I work for, for 
not that thinking is bad, but I work for a, a campaign. It's called the Race to Zero campaign. And this campaign is chaired by something that has a pompous name, the High Level Champion for Climate Action at COP26, which is essentially is the biggest cheerleader or cheerleaders, because there's, there's two of them, uh, a Chilean, Gonzalo Munoz, the previous one, and Nigel Topping, uh, the current one from the UK, to get what's called non-state action going on a number of different sectors. And I lead on regenerative food and agriculture systems, right? The, the hypothesis being that you don't change things by policy. In fact, policy tends to follow non-state actors and investment. So let's work with literally everybody except nation states to send a signal for nation states to legislate ever more ambitious NDCs and climate uh, uh, policy going forward. Why that is important and to your question of why regeneration, why now, why is this important over the next decade? I will refresh here for those that might not be familiar why this is so important, what, where the climate change situation, let me put it that way, is right now. The biggest, possibly most important number that we all have to think about, no matter what you're interested in, is 1.5 by 2050. All the science is very clear. It says that we need to limit warming to no more than 1.5 degrees by 2050 if the impacts of climate change are to be manageable. This comes at a very poignant moment. Uh, with COVID, we've all seen what a global crisis is like. Uh, and unless we do something, there will be more disturbances like that in the future. In fact, a lot of science is indicating that the epidemic itself is a consequence of habitat deterioration and climate change, or at least is made worse by it. So this is a bit of a taste of what's to come unless we, we take action. And what that means in practical terms, it means that we need to have all of our emissions by 2030, and then do it again by 2050. So that is really dramatic. Uh, about three weeks ago, we saw the US finally take a hugely ambitious uh, decarbonization target of having its emissions by 2030. This is the biggest economy in the world. Uh, and that is kind of a signal of the ambition uh, that is needed. Now, to the, to the question of net zero, right? We're going to make our emissions net zero, on balance zero by 2050. The way that could happen, scientists tell us, is roughly speaking, about a third of all those reductions transformation. So trans transport, building, power, all of that will have to find a way less. Some sectors are very hard to abate. Aviation, steel, we need steel. We need, we need some of these things for everything. So cement, you know, like those are really difficult problems uh, to tackle. Third, we we'll remain in the atmosphere. We're going to use the atmosphere as a sink because we're talking about 1.5 increase by 2050. We're going to use the atmosphere as a sink. And the other third is going to have to go into another ocean or land. Now, the only one we can really do something about is land and green nature is a, is a brilliant case in point. So what we're seeing happen at the level is a huge increase, exponential commitment to net zero targets, targets that are scientifically based and proven by an external credible party to put you on track to 1.5 by 2050. Those commitments have doubled. And is a, is a campaign precisely to increase net zero commitments according to science-based targets. But the big looming question, the horizon is, where are we going to offset all that third of emissions that we need to get to, <laughs> to 1.5 by 2050? And the only answer is agriculture. Well, the only, I should say, the answer is stop the foresting and stop land conversion that is proven to be the largest source of that always needs said. But then what happens on the other side of the fence? Well, we need to change agriculture so that it becomes a net sink of carbon and not a net source as it is today. For those people that are less familiar, agriculture now is the single 
uh, land use is the single largest source of emissions, 24% of global emissions, which is crazy if you think that this is based on a synthetic process. That's how reverse it is. And we need to flip that around. Uh, so that is the mission. That is what we're after. Um, I'm a lead on this track at Race to Zero. Right now, uh, just to finish my introduction, I'd want to tell you that we have, uh, just pull the numbers here, 509 cities, 23 regions, 2,168 businesses, 123 investors, 571 institutions, representing 15% of the global economy and 7% of total CO2 emissions under a net zero target. We are confident that we can double that by COP26. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we're doing. And I'm, we're all confident that the food and ag sector will have a huge role to play because they're going to have to fill that gap uh, food and agriculture need to be at least where renewables is today. And the big opportunity that we have, and that's why finance is so important, I think I'm going to talk about that later, um, is that that needs to be regenerative, right? It, you cannot scale up the extractive model because otherwise we're, I want to say doomed. Yeah, it, it's not going to work. Uh, so now is the moment, and I'm incredibly happy to be sharing the floor with you. And uh, also always admiring the work that people like uh, Renee should do. It's time that becomes a norm. Thank you so much, Federico. Like this really gives us, you know, like a, a full picture of how, you know, the the word uh, urgency, uh, you know, is it's 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 intrinsic in in our actions, and that's why I like a lot what you said about instead of thought leaders, like action leaders, because it's so true. Like and 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 uh, I'm I'm sure everybody here is you know working really hard on acting on transitioning and, and uh, we have you know like a very yeah a very dedicated team to try at least to do our best to change uh, the, the food system so so i'll i'll move on uh, uh, so we're still missing uh, guilherme and uh, and marai right so marai uh, guilherme please can you uh, Go for your introduction because I already, you know, seen so many faces. It's a, it's a, it's no a long, it's a, it's, it's a big, big panel. So, uh, yeah. please introduce yourself. Thanks, Felipe. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for for the invitation. I'm speaking from São Paulo, Brazil. I am a well, besides to be a coffee lover, I'm also a food and wine and agroecology lover and a sustainable quality specialist leading the AAA program here in Brazil and in Hawaii. Currently, we have 1,200 farms here and uh, approximately 500 farms in Hawaii as well. And a total of uh, more than 110,000 farmers worldwide in 16 different countries. So uh, uh, the AAA program is based in a relationship with farmers and the, in the three A's stand for quality, sustainability and productivity. So this is the way that we work and sustainable quality is our definition of, of what we believe to be a, a good uh, coffee farming production. And uh, since 2003, in partnership with Reinforced Alliance, we have been working with farmers and uh, creating direct relationships with the AAA agronomists and farmers and improving this, these three A's and working as well with certification. So our main partner is Reinforced Alliance and here in Brazil, since 2005, we have, uh, well, really taking, taking the lead and, uh, and going for certification. And uh, after achieving more than 50% of the coffees as certified in 2017, already uh, achieving our, our targets for 2020, we kind of uh, took a step back and, and started to think in, in 2030, align with the SDGs, and then we identified uh, three main challenges for the, the coffee production in Brazil. First, climate change. Second, uh, uh, human rights and gender equality. And third, use of pesticides. So when we think about climate change and use of pesticides, we are speaking on the coffee farming production and all the different aspects involved. So. Uh, since the beginning, we have been working with a concept, which is uh, integrated crop management, uh, which is implementing, implementing a group of practices that are uh, ranging from fertilization, 
from biological controls and all, and, key, and keeping the pesticides as a last resort. And, and, but this is not enough. And uh, when we look ahead, and we see that the green revolution has uh, makes, made some damage, and there's a lot of people that are started about that, and, I, and, I, and a lot of farmers that are, are also leading the agenda and already are being in the, in the transition. I have been heard a lot in the field, a concept that we are naming in Brazil as the biological revolution. So you see a lot of farmers that are already investing in, in biofactories and are using solutions uh, by nature in, in a lot of, of processes. So that, that was when we started to think on uh, regenerative and now we, we really embedded this concept in our 2030 strategy. So it's one of the main pillars. In our case, we will uh, work on the definition for the re regenerative coffee farming. So looking in, in the coffee as a perennial system and then uh, we, uh, with Renature and other partners, we will uh, work on this definition and we are already uh, installed starting projects in Brazil. So uh, this is our answer. I think this is the answer for the future. And as a, a lot of you guys have mentioned it, uh, in my opinion, is uh, a, a joint venture from all the wisdom of before with the now all the technologies uh, for, from the future. And uh, I think this crystallize, crystallizes, in my opinion, uh, what is regenerative. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Gui, uh, for the for your inspiring answer. And also, like, you know, there's yeah, it's it's really it's really demands a lot of like uh, uh, courage, courageous, like to take lead on, you know, trying to put regenerative agriculture under a portfolio of one thousand two hundred farmers. So it's really uh, it's really ambitious. Uh, but yeah, it's it's needed. And uh, and it's and it's great that they all already have applying some of the principles. So it's like really, you know, it's going to be great to to see some of the evolving uh, processes. I do have a, a one question to you. When will George George Clooney start having a drink a regenerative coffee in a propaganda? <laughs> I think it's going to be soon. Huh? Soon enough. <laughs> okay. At the summit, please. Can we make that happen? <laughs> Absolutely. That would be great. That would yeah. be great. <laughs> no, perfect, perfect. So uh, I'm curious about that. Uh, so I will now uh, uh, give the floor to Marai, um, which is yeah. Uh, we're having a weekly meetings uh, now, and it's it's really amazing to work with him. He is like a really inspiring person, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to our discussions as well. But uh, please, Marai, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you, Felipe. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so yes, I um, I always uh, introduce myself as a circular economy activist who uh, happens to work at a big food company called Danone. Um, and within the organization, uh, I focus on the intersection of open innovation and the circular economy for food. And um, I focus on that intersection because I strongly believe that innovation is actually the adaptive power of the system. And to come back and also start answering already a little bit that question that you raised about why uh, regen and why for a nature positive uh, system. I think it was already mentioned, but the food system is a nodal point within a larger system level transition. And as I was listening to uh, everybody else uh, introducing themselves, I actually think that what Emma gave, which is really interesting, is Emma gave the vision uh, for a new system, a new, an alternative economic model that also includes the food system, which is shifting from where we were, which was mechanistic and very uh, anthropocentric, so very much centered around humans thinking mechanistically and to Guy's point, um, disconnecting ourselves from that, that, uh, that ancient wisdom, um, but had a degenerative effect on everything that we do. And what we are now moving towards is we need to move towards a biocentric uh, worldview, um, a system that actually works with nature where we are bio becoming. 
um, where we start to embrace resilience, et cetera. And um, what I think is interesting that um, Frederica was basically giving the goal. Why do we need to do this? Well, here's the goalpost. We need to meet this 1.5. Uh, and Christine, I think, is bringing in here um, the, the community of activists. I call this on a previous call with Christine, actually, the food generation, a generation that is uh, ready and able to actually shift, make that system shift through innovation. And so I think that that is basically why um, regenerative agriculture is so important because it's a nodal point within a system shift, but it's also a point that we can relate to. When we start to look at regeneration in the broader sense of the world, including social regeneration, it becomes often um, fairly theoretical and hard for uh, people and also consumers as they stand in front of a shelf to relate. But when we think about the regenerative capacity of soil, it's evident. And to the point that was made before, if there is one system within all of the systems around it, within the larger system that we live within, that actually has to become positive, it's the food system. Aiming for neutrality in the food system or even being just restorative, but not building capacity, not going all the way to regenerative, simply isn't enough within the food system. So if, if you think about it that way, I would say it's a no brainer. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marai. Yeah, it's, this is a really good uh, synthesis and overview of all the contributions for, the, for just the introduction, which is just the beginning uh, of our session. I mean, we do have a way to go. So like now I really would like for us to jump into a uh, you know, uh, discussion. So thanks everybody for the introductions. Uh, and now I'd like to open the panel discussion on one of the most challenging questions in the industry, transition finance. The role of corporates and investors in financing the transition towards regenerative practices. This panel is meant to be a flexible bar conversation. Drinks are on Pugas and Thais Bill, by the way. Just kidding. Uh, and so open your mics for the speakers uh, to feel at home and give your opinion and contribution to the topic. Uh, let's start with asking openly, uh, which financial instruments are being used or has to be used for us to adopt and scale regenerative agriculture practices among industries? What's the role of corporates and investors in this process? So my fellow panelists, feel free to start, you know, without having uh, any pointed fingers uh, in this discussion. I think that I can start, then uh, I just will open the, the discussion here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear, but everybody can yeah. open your mics as well. So yep, we can okay. hear you just fine. Yeah. yeah. So I think that there's uh, depend there's there's a lot of, of financial solutions in place, and for sure this is something that we have been developing all over the, the years, and every day a new uh, uh, um, idea on financial solution. This is something that happens when we talk to a client or talk to another financial institution. Um, there are many mechanisms in place. I think that depends on the focus. So if you're going to, on the, the farm level, I think that we have a differentiation between the small holder and the, the big farmer. So the big farmer, he can make a, a, a Are we missing, Thais? Yeah, she yeah. broke. Breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, like, um, oh, a remix of Thais. <laughs> 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 but uh, if anyone wants to jump in and uh, you know express your uh, your your you know your view on this topic, uh, feel free to do so. Felipe, well, if, if I, I oh, go ahead, please. I say please. Oh, ladies first, please. <laughs> okay. I uh, can okay. <laughs> Excess of education. That's the problem. <laughs> Please, you, and then I can go after you. No problem. Perfect. Thank you, Christine. As uh, as I am, uh, as Thais and I are paying for the for the drinks on this part of the panel, um, I would jump in. Um, I'm 
focus a little more about Brazil because each and every country is very different from each other. We can't compare Brazil to European Union to Africa. It's impossible to compare regions. Um, here in Brazil, we have a highly concentrated banking system. We have very few banks providing credits to the producers, to the farmers. And not all the banks are so serious and eco-friendly as Hubble Bank that is doing a wonderful job for low carbon agriculture in Brazil. Um, we have shortage of uh, long-term uh, loans, long-term credit. We don't have patient capital in Brazil to provide long-term uh, financial mechanisms, credit funds. And uh, if you want to jump to, into regenerative agriculture, you have to have access to long-term, to long-duration loans. You can't have a, a only one year uh, uh, term that's the one, that the kind of uh, credits that you have available in Brazil nowadays. And historically, we have been very dependent on, depend on the federal government. Uh, most of the, of the money provided for as loans, uh, long-term loans to the producers in Brazil is provided by the federal government. And nowadays with the COVID-19, uh, the revenues has uh, dropped as you may figure, and the costs uh, are very high, high now in, by the federal government. And uh, of course, that we will not have the, the needed, the money necessary to do the transformation to provide more loans. So uh, we have, if you want to promote the change in the direction of regenerative culture, we must face those challenges. Uh, creating credit lines that are not only suitable for the regenerative culture, but also much more seductive than the traditional credit lines that are provided nowadays for the traditional farming. Uh, we have to think that, uh, at, at least at JGP, we like to think that money is much like, like, like water. Uh, it flows through the easiest path. Uh, it flows through the largest pipes. Even in the end, uh, the cost is too high. It's particularly high and sheer costs. But um, when we say that the uh, credit must be easy, we're not just talking about interest rates. We are talking about bureaucracy. We are talking about trust. Uh, here in Brazil, more than 40% of all the producers has never accessed credit lines. Uh, they are always access credit lines through resellers, through cooperatives, through multinationals, through traders. And uh, these are not the best uh, credit lines to access, um, but they are the one that they trust. That's the one that's less bureaucratic. So as part of our financial sector, we have to be, as I told before, more farm-centric, to understand their needs, to understand their desires, to understand their fears, and adjust our offerings to the profile of the farmers. Because we have uh, ca uh, patient capital in the end market through some impact investors, through planted finance, but we have to create this in order to really talk to the farmer because there are plenty of good intention projects that uh, uh, once dream to provide easy loans to the regenerative culture that never reach it, the farmer. And uh, we can't blame the farmer. We have to blame ourselves. We haven't fought properly. Uh, we haven't fought that those offers uh, had to build breaches with the farmers that's the true protagonists of the changes. It's not the banks. It's not the asset managers. It's the farmer. He's the one that will implement. He's the one that will uh, borrow the credit. So we have to adjust our uh, credit lines to uh, reduce uh, the seduction of the traditional farm and, uh, and upgrade uh, the easiness and seduction of the, and the trust worth of the credit line for the regenerative agriculture. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm back? Yes, okay. I, yeah, I don't know. What I was happens. just occupying yeah, the stage for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's glad to be with you, Puga, you know. Uh, I, I miss what you said, Puga. I, I just got in the middle of what you were you, you were saying, but at the end, I got your message of focusing on the rural farmers and their needs. I think that this is the most important and relevant thing to say right now, because when we talk about financing a farmer, we need to understand what do they need. They need financial a financial solution. They need long term. They they need. Uh, uh, better interest rate or they need technical assistance. Sometimes he, 
has no idea on how to apply this. So he can has the credit, but he has no idea on how to apply this new methodology or this uh, regenerative agriculture in the field. So trying to build and trying to bring this together, and I will put here the Agri3 fund that we have, that it's something that makes together the technical assistance and the low one in order to boost the, the result. I think that this can be one of the financial solutions that we are discussing here to boost the, the, the regenerative agriculture. Another thing that I want to say is regarding the smallholders when we talk about access to credit. And I, I, I heard that you, you mentioned this, Fulda. Um, the access to credit is something that it's quite difficult here in Brazil. I, I'm focusing here is here is my experience on working on the farmers. Um, some of them has no title of the land. Some of them has uh, uh, not, not don't have the doc documentation of the area. So how to 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 provide this guy a uh, uh, credit? Um, so. And in the other hand, when we talk about a regenerative agriculture, so he, he has today uh, uh, one system, he, he uh, understands what he's doing and he needs to shift into another uh, uh, agribusiness solution. This transition must be something that they, they must understand what, uh, what are their risks as well. So when a bank jumps in into this discussion, the first thing that the bank asks is, how long have you been working with this commodity? And when we're talking about shifting the, the strategical plan of the, the farm, it must be really robust to bring uh, this comfort to the, the, the financial solution as well, the financial issue to the, sorry, as well, to bring the, this comfort to, 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 uh, to be able to finance him. Um, yeah. Just yeah. an additional information here. Too. Those are very important two points. And that's also like what makes the life of farmers challenging to make decisions on which kind of financial instruments they can choose is, is also because they have, uh, you know, if they're willing to change their uh, agricultural system and apply new principles, it means that they need to expand some sort of like uh, capital to design a system in which will make sense as uh, you know a notion for him on the business model because the current business models they have in which they go for out out for a credit or an investment is based on the conventional uh, agriculture practice so so there's a lot of you know uh, capital that needs to be allocated for, as, as a pre-finance or a pre you know uh, investment uh, on an early stage to allow these investments to become bigger and, and, and grow with the farmer once the design and, and the context has been defined with the farmer. Um, sure. But there are very and, and few. Here, yeah. But, yeah, no, you please. Can go, please. No, here, here we can count on the risking facilities as well. So the risking facilities is the one that you invite to be part of the, the, the solution, the financial solution. And this could be a company, this could be Danone, this could be uh, Unilever, this could be any, any big company that work, wants to work together on a de-risking facility to invest in these farmers. So this is another thing that... Multi-stakeholder yeah. approach, yeah. yeah. Uh, Federico, you raise your hand, so I will give, yeah, give you the voice as well. On the I will come in. Before, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I want to respect the order. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, Christine, then yeah. Federico, then Emma and then Pugas. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, just very quickly, I wanted to interject a, a couple of points. The first one being that I think this point of the transition is very important. And in that case, there is a lot of creativity and excitement at the risk of even becoming hype right now, but about how to fund this transition. And I get asked a lot by journalists, investors, startups about you know, carbon farming. Is it real? Is it not? What should we do? Um, and my feeling on this is that we know that a lot of the practices that are being incentivized in carbon farming are good for the world. They help to improve soil health. They help to protect biodiversity and can help with water use efficiency and other types of environmental benefits. Now, there are questions, of course, around the um, 
verification, right, of how much uh, uh, carbon is being sequestered. It, we also need to look at, you know, other greenhouse gases. And but at the the point is, these questions need to be considered and they need to be taken seriously. But we shouldn't like stop something that we know has some positive impacts, whether or not it is sequestering carbon at what levels for how long, because there are the, these benefits that we know from cover cropping and optimizing production in the right places. It, it's kind of like an intensify, intensification of agriculture in the right places so that we aren't just growing more crops in places that actually aren't um, highly productive. And I've seen some really great companies actually using like drone technology and geospatial information to really help you know make decisions for farmers, as well as a plethora of companies that are developing the sensors and the measurement tools and the validation, et cetera. There's a groundswell of innovation that is following a bit of this excitement and hype. It's the gold rush, if you will. And like, I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. The other thing I think is really important is the government's role. And in this point, you know, you've seen governments talking about payment for ecosystem services, how, yeah. you know, the public goods can be factored into um, some of the mechanisms and subsidy programs that they are providing. And I wanted to just mention one really fascinating thing that I just read yesterday. I posted about it on my LinkedIn. But in the UK, they are now going to pay an equivalent subsidy to older farmers to retire so that a new generation of young people who they believe will bring more innovation and more sustainability and regenerative mindedness can come take over the land and lead this charge. I thought, wow, that's really fascinating. This is a disruptive model that a government can take to basically say, let's incentivize the next generation to come in because their hypothesis is that they will come in with open-mindedness to regenerative practices. And actually some of the language used by the environment, environmental minister was very strong saying that the older generations, they're entrenched they don't want to change. And, you know, actually we have to pay them to get out of the way. And woof, I mean, it was pretty jarring, but at the same time, interesting. I thought, should we do this to politics too? <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it there. Very nice. I strongly agree. Uh, thank you, Christine. And um, I think I might expand on that. Uh, A, from the recklessness of somebody who does not do finance. So pardon for that. I will just, you know, fire away, uh, but also perhaps mentioning uh, some action that I think is very much in that direction uh, that I see from this vantage point that I have right now as a global campaigner. Um, for example, just before Earth Day, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero was launched. Uh, this means that it's an alliance regrouping a third of all assets under management today. That's about 70 trillion. Uh, to a science-based target for net zero, right? So this is not early adoptions anymore. This is very much in the mainstream. That's where the financial sector is going to go. And where will the financial sector meet its target? Well, by investing in other enterprises across sectors that can help it meet that net zero target. And as we've been saying here, agriculture should be uh, very high in that list. Now the question is what kind of agriculture and that, that's another uh, kettle of fish. But, um, you know, you were talking about uh, regeneration and sort of to demystify it, but regeneration is, is essentially a systems approach, is a design approach and it's about connection. And I think that something that's been missing is a more comprehensive view at finance and the economy. So. Some of you might be speaking from the perspective of a private financier that has a role in the biggest financial uh, landscape, but there's also development finance, sovereign wealth funds, public funds, and those should really work together. For example, uh, it is very counterproductive that a country that signs on to an NDC and has a climate target on one end should subsidize the kind of agriculture that goes in the opposite direction. Diesel for tractors, for example, or something like that. So these are from an advocacy perspective, very low hanging fruit to align subsidies with Paris targets, right? And that would open the field up a lot. You know, there's a lot of questions coming through the chat. I hope somebody then can synthesize them because they're very good questions. Uh, and it's a shame not to answer them. Uh, but in terms of support to small groups, all kinds of things, 
there's a huge role here for public finance because a lot of the benefits of regenerative agriculture are public and not private, such like the, the co-benefits that Christine was mentioning. Procurement. I mean, imagine if every, every meal in a country paid with taxpayer money should be preferentially sourced from a regenerative source. Or the person making that purchase should face some questions from the tax authority. Why did you not choose a regenerative source when that was available? That would send a huge signal to the market. I mean, so many SMEs would form to try and structure that market, which would then in turn be very good for private funds. But I want to end perhaps on, on, on an idea, yeah? again, with, with my recklessness. <laughs> One of the, one of the, the uh, and the key hinging on this idea that Philippe introduced of transition, right? Because that's that's the hard one. Well, the good news is we know what success looks like. If you go to one of the projects that Green Nature works on, you can see what success looks like, right? Uh, there's no question that that sequesters carbon. That is good for people. It's good for nature. It's good for so many things, right? The problem is that it takes some time, right? But we can measure it. So. To me, something that, that would be great to have is a fund, a large fund, bigger than the Amazon fund was for Brazil back in the days when it was a billion. You know, now we're talking trillions for COVID, but a multi-billion fund with the right public-private oversight that accumulates all the finance from these net zero commitments, right? Because companies will have to reduce and then buy somewhere the rest of the reduction. So that money, that purchase can go into this fund, right? And this fund pays out once a farm after X amount of times can be measured to have made an improvement. So it's like a bond, right? Or even better if it was a futures contract because what farmers want, they want to be paid up front and they're right, yeah. right? So we know with a high level of confidence that if you do regenerative agriculture practices A, B, and C, you will get a pretty good result at the end. That is, we have a high degree of confidence for that, right? So if we had a fund like this, that would send a signal for farmers to make whatever choices they need to make, uh, knowing that they would be compensated for the private and public benefits that they bring over time. And um, I will just end with one of people who probably all know, Bill Sharp, he's done a lot of thinking on regeneration. To me, he's got the most elegant economic definition of regeneration. And he says, regeneration only produces positive externalities, right? Yeah. Right now, our food system only produces negative externalities, right? <laughs> it more waste than it produces. Uh, that's what the flip, and you want a system that only produces positive externalities. Yeah. No, yeah, that's that's really great that you mentioned this, uh, Federico. It's it's really powerful this this message, uh, and I really recommend also the the reading about uh, these these books and also Chris Daniel Christian Wall books on regenerative cultures is also another one that is really inspiring. But uh, we see that we see some raised hands, uh, so yeah, I will go. Emma, would you like to to intervene? Yeah, happy to hop in here. I'm maybe good building off of some of Federico's last comments, which I can describe as creating incentive structures when you start to see ecosystem payments or being administered appropriately. And I just want to offer a couple of other points for us to consider in the conversation. One indeed being how do you, how do you create and optimize the incentives when you go through that come after the three to 10 year um, transition period and you get to steady state because it can be such a range. I see some questions coming up in the in the chat and I am not going to claim that I am a farming expert, but from our work at least, we see that it is a big range. And if you look at something like wheat, it's more in the three to seven year range, at least in Europe and the UK, versus you look at a silvo pasture system and you're planting trees it's gonna be a decade to actually have them in a mature state. So how do you, I wanna put forward two things for us. One is how might we minimize the costs of the transition in the first place? And how can we maximize the benefits at the steady state from an economic standpoint? Um, and then what are the mechanisms and, and these collaborative models that can come forward from a, cost sharing perspective. And 
we're just for context, we're in the midst of doing some analysis at the foundation, which we'll be publishing um, probably in September. But what we realize is um, you can maximize that incentive and revenue for the farmer in their steady state if you create the right demand for buying everything coming off the farm. So this is where I'm, the role of the buyers comes in. You know, companies like Nestle and Nespresso and Danone who are major buyers and they create the markets, right? The actual markets. These aren't the, the newly emerging ecosystem markets, the actual markets for those ingredients. And we have to make choices when we're designing our products and when retailers are picking what they're sourcing. You're making choices that have impacts that radiate through the system. And so you can work with your farmer. This is why it's so important to work with the farmer, right? It doesn't come afterwards. With the farmer to make those design decisions so that the crops that you're introducing into a regenerative system, the intercrops, the crop rotations, the cover crops, they're actually ones that are then sold. They're not just ones that stay on the field. And when you make that shift, you're maximizing for all of the inputs. So you're getting better environmental outcomes as well. You're maximizing the land use, you're maximizing nutrition per hectare, and you're boosting the revenues. What we're seeing in our analysis from wheat, potatoes, and dairy, you can move to regenerative just with those ingredients and you can get good benefits and you can actually see yields increasing from five to 10% at steady state. And you can see the net value creation ranging from 13 to 40,000 US dollars a year. But when you go that integrated shift and, and you're actually selling everything as cash crops, that's where you can get yield boost of 40 to 65% on that same area of land. And the net rev or the net value creation is can be 80 to 200,000. US dollars a year. So that's just to say, you know, how do we make that future prize as incentivizing as possible? And the role of the buyers and the market is so key because the farmers aren't going to make these choices on their own. The market needs to lead. And then how can you drive down the costs as well up front? And that's where we think of new collaboration vehicles as well. And what we can see, and I've read some studies recently around when you're pooling resources amidst farmers, whether it's training or even equipment, that can also be driving down the costs as well up front. And then comes in to Thais and everyone else's great comments around, you know, it is multi-stakeholder. So it's not just about farmers, it's not just about financial institution. What about the contract terms? Where do those, those pots of money that more and more companies are allocating to supporting regenerative agriculture transition, how is that coming into training hubs or model farms and doing that in a more collaborative way to optimize everyone's resources? So I just want to put forward a few more concepts to think about in the discussion. Perfect, thank you, Emma. And uh, this, is, this, this is really strong, like how, you know, how farmers seeing the offtake agreements with like a better prices on the regenerative products can also, you know, uh, be another tool for inspiring them to go through this transition. Aside from all the ecosystem services and and and, and the concepts about uh, food and innovative food systems, so so this this is definitely something uh, you know like uh, powerful for us to to mention. So I'll I'll leave the uh, the floor because I I don't have the order here. But I, ask, I, I remember it was Guilherme and then Pugas and then Marine. So uh, let's let's see if that works for you guys. I figured Pugas was before, but I was okay. just 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 being just just make uh, the connection with them. I think for the private sector is not only ensuring that you are buying the the products from the supply chain, but also uh, with a price differentiation or premium on top, because uh, I would say that this in the transition period is a must. This is something that uh, normally we do. And then offering technical assistance. So this is part of the package uh, through projects in the, in the supply chain. And then paying for like, ecosystem services, but uh, uh, this is a, a bl blended finance and, and then led by the private sector. So this is what we are uh, currently, currently doing. And what we are not still doing is, that, is uh, counting on the carbon markets. 
And uh, this is something that we will do. And uh, I think one aspect, uh, because there were some questions regarding the small holders. So the only way to, to you know, take all the, the small holders in the same boat is clusterization. So we're reorganizing the supply chain to be able to scale up. When we think about on regenerative, we go for, from a plot to a farm to the landscape. So this, the, in this flow, you need to take in consideration and then uh, to be able to, to, to group uh, either to a cooperative or association, this is a must to be able to, to go and have access to the international funding system. So I, I would say that these are the, the, the ways that we are thinking on engaging and, and uh, the way that, that we will do to finance the transition period. Perfect. Thank you so much, Guy, for sharing this. Uh, it's going to be a long journey, but it's going to be also like, uh, yeah, it's, it's together, like it's, we are stronger on, on, on supporting each other on this path. Uh, it's not easy, as you always say, as well, but, uh, but with the right, uh, you know, environment and, and people, we, we, can, we are achieving that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, so basically now, uh, Pugas, uh, you can uh, jump uh, in the floor. Please. It will be a very short statement, I hope. Uh, but uh, uh, listening to every panelist and thinking about the, the best practices that we are developing for our funds, the ones that are really working, I would like to share some of these good practices that we are seeing in those funds, in those funds that are providing better credit for the, for the producer. First, to engage the supply chain. It's impossible not to engage the off-taker. But, uh, but we have to go further than just best prices, than just premium prices. Um, as Thais was saying, um, to have collaterals is something very sensitive for the smallholder. They just have one land. They can't put the same land in three different, as, as the same collateral for three different credit operations. Um, it will not happen. Sometimes they even have, they even didn't have the land title. So when engaged the supply chain, we can use the off-taker agreements and the receivables as part of this collateral, as guarantees for its financial operations. So we have to go further. We had just, uh, the supply chain must be engaged, uh, uh, approving the use of off-taker agreements and, uh, and receivables as part of this collateral for the development of more sophisticated mechanisms, such as credit rights and funds that we are operating here in Brazil. Second is the use of carbon credits and uh, ecosystem payments as part of the payment by the producers. It's a way to reduce the cost of uh, the financial cost for the producer once they are using this carbon credits and this ecosystem payments as part of the payments of the installments in the amortization of the loans. Yeah, we are doing that's, this that, and that, uh, that, that's something I, I, it's very interesting that you're trying to touch this point. Uh, I'm, yeah, like if you can explain how JGP is like looking at including the, the carbon or the ecosystem services, you know, capital inside the funds would be great. Uh, yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, what we are providing is soft taker agreements. We have some partnership with some uh, some project developers and carbon traders. So we treat them as a commodity, such as the soybeans or the, or the cattle. Um, when we use the carbon credits in this off-taker agreements, we guarantee that we did the purchase of this carbon credit throughout the period of the duration of this loan. So uh, we have the, uh, the assurance that this carbon credits will be converted into money and the money will be cashed in the credit right fund. So we have a full operation. We face this carbon credits as a, a different kind of revenue for the fund. So we can, of course, uh, allow the producer to engage this carbon credits, this ecosystem payments inside uh, the credit right funds as, a, as the, same, uh, the same level that we accept uh, their money or the harvest or any other uh, revenue stream uh, for this. Uh, for this. So uh, into HHEP, we're developing some funds help with the help of Mirova, for example, that we use the soft taker agreements for the carbon credits as part, as receivable 
for the collaterals and as part of the payments of the installments uh, of those producers. Uh, for example, in agroforestry, uh, you have a, a, a major challenge to provide profits enough to pay for the interest rates, but they produce a lot of carbon credits. So why not use the carbon credits, this ecosystem payment, more than use the, the profits of the crop that are very, very little in the beginning of the production. So uh, they're not enough for to sustain loans. Uh, so uh, we are certain this in some of our funds, in matter of fact, in almost all, all of our regenerative agriculture funds with cooperatives, with off takers and others, uh, beneficiaries of those funds. And that's something that we'd like to say that we are always asking producers uh, to cater in cooperatives, in association, in supply chains, because when you do that, you reduce the cost of the, you dilute the cost of structuring the sophisticated mechanisms, reduce the cost of project developing for farmer or carbon farming that is very high. But we have, when you have a, a cooperative and you have this association, uh, it re reduces the cost and reduce um, also the cost of structuring the, the funds, not only the carbon funds, but also the credit rights funds, mainly because we insert the costs inside the fund costs. We are not, we are not treating it separately. We are treating them all together. And when you treat that all together, we have this reduction of final cost to the producer. And um, I would just like to end my statement. Um, Federico, if you want to develop this fund, count on us to think outside the box to make it happen. A wonderful idea, count on JGP. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pugas. This is, this is excellent. Uh, it's 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 much important in this role, like uh, on on this in this field of regenerative, because it's it's very new now uh, that uh, you know fund managers and asset managers are including regenerative in their portfolio. So so you know, and all these buzz on ESG. So it, it's very important now to align on expectations and trying to work together to reach the target. So really amazing contribution. So Marain, uh, would you like to take the floor? and uh, give us your yeah. view on this topic? Yeah, I'll, I'll actually try to do the same thing uh, again and try to synthesize a little bit. But I think what we're seeing is um, three, maybe four major blocks here. One is we're faced with a uh, financial model, an economic model that is no longer fit for purpose. It's not broken, but it's simply no longer fit for purpose. Um, and we see that because of the, the simplest way to illustrate it is we have the very notion of a cash crop, which is a human construct and a flawed human construct, I would say, because it basically means that there is a crop that generates cash. But nature doesn't just produce one crop. Nature produces a whole system. And that system is in balance, in a dynamic balance, but that system is in balance. And um, on the other hand side, that leads into the second problem, which is a business model issue. Uh, because typically a farm is highly leveraged and has a high volatility, both in um, quantities produced and in its prices. And so on that side, we need to work towards business model innovation. And it's in that business model innovation, for instance, that we uh, the big food companies can actually work with the farmers to find alternative models, models that um, will stimulate diversity and diversification of income streams, models that will actually help to monetize the positive externalities, which today are not being monetized. And on the other hand side, ways to find, find ways to internalize the negative externalities. What is often challenging in this conversation is that also some of these companies, large organizations, are part of the same financial model, which is a financial model that today is very much ran by, by growth investors and not by cash flow investors. And so the resilience of your investments is underappreciated. And we look at the short term return, but we don't necessarily look at the long term resilience of those investments. And in all that, what I, what I think that we always also have to remember is that it, the farmer isn't the problem. 
the farmer is like doing exactly what the system is demanding from the farmer. And so if we talk about farming, what we have to address is a system that is no longer fit for purpose. And what we have to do, rather than tell the farmer they're wrong, they're not doing things the way they should be doing, we have to start designing for something different. We have to help that farmer to uh, find their agency and empower them to actually be able to have a healthy business and have a regenerative ecological. And I saw some questions in the, um, in the nice. chat, it's, social it's impact good. as well. Yeah, yeah, like and what Ernst calls farmers also is like ecosystem engineers, which is very interesting uh, related to what you're saying as well. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, uh, it's about stewardship and, and to that point of ecosystem engineers, the, the, the fourth thing that I think that we miss or that we need, and it comes back to um, the volatility or, or the lack of foresight is data. Um, regenerative industrial mechanistic farming is, is, is easy to scale and roll out because you kind of place yourself above nature and you start to control the system with all the negative and degenerative effects that it has. When you move back to regenerative practices, your practices become highly localized and specialized. And therefore, there's a lack of foresight. And that lack of foresight is just like Thais was saying, that's a problem in today's financial model because when you come, when you come to that banker, they're gonna wanna see numbers. And even for yourself as a farmer, how long is my transition period gonna be? Well, to date, we're unfortunately not at the point where we can simply put that into a model. So I think it's all four of these that need to be addressed. And I think everybody plays a role in that. But what we always have to remember is the farmer is not the problem. Um, it's the way we've designed the system that is the issue. We're focusing on yields. By focusing on yield, we are going to specialize, we're going to centralize, we're going to commoditize. That makes indeed for an efficient system when it comes to yield, but it also makes for a very, very fragile system and a system that is completely disconnected from nature. Perfect. Couldn't close any better than that. Thank you so much, Marijn. Uh, we have rounded up these two uh, panel discussions, which we embarked the, and then both in, the, in one, uh, which was the best way to move there. What an exciting and enriching debate we're having here. We should all go home by now feeling much smarter and ready to I, regenerate our I loved food the idea of um, women and men as two of the land. This is a good, this is a good image. Which one, sorry? Which one did you, did you say? Women sorry? and men being the steward. Women and men being the steward, the stewards of the land, or if you yeah. allow me, of the coffee terroir. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. good. Good, good, <laughs> good one. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, perfect. Because today we really now feel, uh, you know, like we all can play a role with all this exchange that we have today. And, and, and we can play a role in, you know, making our food systems more regenerative so that we can have a profitable and equitable future. So now let's have a, a quick exchange with the audience because we have a few minutes left. Uh, so, so there is not much, you know, we will not be able to answer all the questions, but uh, we will capture them and then we will uh, hopefully try to answer them uh, as much as possible if you send us a mail to contact at renature.co so that we can try to answer them. Um, and here's an interesting question we have. Uh, uh, Felipe, we to... Yeah. sorry to interject. I, I don't want to cut your flow, but there's we've spoken a lot about farmers and a lot of people in this panel are not farmers. Certainly I'm not one. Uh, if there's a farmer in the audience, uh, I would invite or encourage to speak up if that's possible. Perfect, that's a good one. Maybe to speak up is not going to be possible because they cannot uh, open their uh, you know camera and mic. But if they want to drop a quick question, type uh, up. Yeah, there is a question that is interesting. It is also related to as a, as a farmer, uh, as a large farmer in Brazil, for instance, asking how can we change large commodity, mostly soy, corn, and cotton, for instance, growers' mind uh, mindset from their current industrial agriculture techniques into regenerative agriculture. Here in Brazil, there are 
these are by far the largest farms along with cattle. And in my opinion, probably the most important focus to achieve the net zero goals by 2050. So how can we target such large uh, challenge with these this big commodity uh, players, farmers? Introduce them to Renature. <laughs> Uh, I'll have a very short stab at that. Please, but I, please go I often please. find that you know food is such a huge term. Agriculture is such a huge term. Some of these large farms are really commodity farms. Often they're not even food, like cotton. Yeah. Um, often soy is to feed pigs in China, right? Um, so these things are very different and require different approaches. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but I would say that it's a combination of low impact, high adoption strategies. So even if you can make a large piece of land like cotton or beef 50% more effective, do it because it's so large that it's gonna have a big impact. And that can be done by off the shelf techniques like no-till cover crop, et cetera, that don't sequester much, but they're better than losing your soil. They're better than what you have. And then you've got smaller, high impact, less adoption. And I think that is where Renature works a lot, agro, silvo, forestry, and those things. Incredibly high impact with lots of benefits. They don't cover so much land, but they have, they, they're, they're really dense in terms of impact. And I think at a landscape level, the solution is a little bit of these two, uh, at least on the landscape. Then there's all the levers like finance that we have discussed here in policy. It's interesting what you're saying, Frederico, because basically it comes to the theory of change and the theory of change in, in, in a large systemic shift, the shift in paradigm is that you want to be able to leapfrog your large impact, large skill operations from one day to the next. Um, but in those, you're going to have to move through those stages going from degenerative to being neutral, to being restorative, to in the end goal become regenerative. And in the meanwhile, in the niches, and that's just the way nature innovates, right? Think about Cambrian explosions, uh, for instance, in coral reefs. In the niches is where you're going to have that leapfrog and where you're going to have innovation that sets that signal function that then shows that actually this is a economically viable way of farming. And with that also starts to impact the mental maybe barriers, the, the fact that we just can't really envision and imagine what that would look like, uh, that's also the function of this niche. So you right. need the breakthrough niche and you need the stepwise scale. And I would just add that there's probably a different financial instrument for each, but I'm sure other speakers might, might want to react to. Or not as well, which is fine. <laughs> but, uh, oh, Christine, are you all you? Yeah, I, I mean, oh, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to jump in because I think like um, so often, uh, you know, we get caught up in the, you know, technicalities and also in the negative narrative that's, you know, bombarding us in the media. But I mean, look here today. It's like a Thursday afternoon here in Switzerland, different times I know in different parts of the world. We have like 120 plus people joined together talking about how to create this, you know, regenerative now and future that we need. There is, and this is like the third of these types of calls I've been on just today because we've been part of these UN Food System Summit dialogues. There's, a, you know, it's a big moment in time for food systems. And to just kind of double down on the point that Marin said about the fact that like the system is working how it's been designed. We designed the system, it's working, it's producing calories at scale, you know, um, and it has a lot of problems that have come with it. But if you think about the fact that it's working how it's designed, it means we have agency to design something new. And, you know, we can design this, we can design our way out of this if we have the will, and I believe we do, and we have the way, you know, and we're figuring that out, and we have the technologies and the know-how, and we can scale that, we can scale that know-how. And interestingly, in some of the sessions I've been, you know, that concept of scale is like changing. It's not about a one-size-fits-all solution scaling, it's about knowledge and know-how and principles scaling and knowledge scaling. And this is really exciting because technology can allow us to do that. 
And to the points that have been made, we have to build the business models around this, et cetera. But I think like what Emma presented in terms of those numbers is like, yeah, that's the narrative we need to get out there and fast. And we all have the capability to do that, whether we're farmers or not, we can beat the drum on this story and um, show what's possible. So I just wanted to mention that because I always, you know, get excited by this stuff and want to inject that into, you know, everybody else. <laughs> so, I know you so well already, Chrissy, and, and I know, I know Marine is shaking already. You wanted to. Yeah, no, because <laughs> just to Christine's point, one thing is we are not locked in this system. We're locked in our own minds. The system is less than one millisecond old in the 3.8 billion years of the real lifetime experiment that we are living within, which is nature. So being locked in into the system, it's in our heads. We can redesign the system. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys. Thank I will you. double down on that and perhaps the campaigner urgency in me. Uh, I've, I'm a host in the United States now. With COVID, we saw something between four or five trillion dollars pumped into the economic system in one year without anybody really making sophisticated calculations about how that's going to be evaluated and what is going to be the framework to do it. They knew, we knew we had to get something done and the resources flowed. So there's something about a positive urgency narrative, much, very much along the lines that Christina's saying, that we need to get out there because. 1.5 by 2050, you have to be running today. So join the race. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let's join the race, guys. And I would like to close this outstanding panel discussions we had today. And if you have enjoyed the panel like I did and feel ready to join us in this mission to make regenerative agriculture mainstream, uh, subscribe to our newsletter as we will be organizing many other webinars. And once COVID allows, we also have many practical field workshops with farmers because before COVID came, Renature was already organizing a program called Change Makers, which is bringing individuals to come to the field and put their hands in the soil and feel the, you know, feel the, the, the regeneration by practice. So, so thank you, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers and for the inspiring presence and words that you guys have brought to us. Also, Renature Communications team, Samantha and Misha, who have greatly organized this open dialogue. Let's together spread the good news around us. Let's together make regenerative agriculture mainstream. So thank you, everybody, and uh, let's do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. so much. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.